We can now move on to the panel portion of tonight's meeting. Our two topics are legal representation for your building's contracts, what boards need to know, as well as aging buildings, the steps that boards should take. At this point, I will introduce Daniel Finger, an attorney with Finger and Finger, a professional corporation of White Plains. Finger and Finger serves as chief counsel to the BRI and the CCAC. You all know Daniel. He has spoken at several of our meetings and seminars in the past, and he also contributes to Impact Newspaper, our bi-monthly publication. Daniel will, actually, Daniel will address the first issue, legal representation for your building's contracts, what boards, needs to, what boards need to know. Dan, it's all yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, this, this is actually a difficult topic for me because people study this uh, kind of thing for years in law school, so it's, it's tough to summarize contracts in a five-minute speech. Uh, but I'm just going to go through some of the things that I think about when I'm drafting a contract for the cooperatives and condominiums that I represent, highlight some of the, uh, the issues that we go through, um, and then at the end, if there's any questions, I can address that or afterwards. Um, and the, in any event, um, the, the contract that your vendor or your contractor might give you is not really a contract. They usually hand you a proposal, they try to have you sign off on it. Um, that's not a contract. That, that's a proposal. Signing off on it will, you know, can bind you, but you have to be very careful um, because that does not have the protections that a normal contract would have. We, for, for most of our clients, the cooperatives and condominiums that we represent, we draft all of their contracts whenever they're doing anything from construction, uh, landscaping, snow plow, um, you know, even property management, cleaning, you know, whatever it is, anytime that you're in a relationship with a, with a vendor or, a third, or another party, we draft a contract. Uh, the, the reason, in a one-sentence nutshell for that, is that you want all the parties to the contract to have an understanding of the purpose of the relationship and the parameters of the relationship. Why, you know, what it is that, that you, as, as a co-op or condominium board, expect of the contractor and what the contractor expects that, that their responsibilities are going to be. You want to have an understanding of that and you want to have that memorialized in writing so that way if there's any confusion, you have something to go back to and to fall back on and you all know what your rights are. Um, again, signing a proposal from a vendor is not really enough to address that or to give you those kind of protections. Um, a lot of times when we're drafting a contract, we, we don't just sit down and, and just come up with something general. We go through the specifications for the project, the bid, um, if they're, you know, and, and if it's a, and, you know, I'm gonna mostly refer to construction um, issues, but um, when you're dealing with a larger project, we, we will often work with the engineer or the architect will have when they're when they're first creating the specifications and before it even goes out to bid and what we like to do in those larger projects is we like to give them a, a template of the contract uh, for a couple reasons before they send the bids out so that way number one they can look at the contract and they can tell us if there's any issues that that were any any terms that we've put or any issues that we've raised that either are not typical to that particular type of project or you know, need to be modified. Some could be the payment terms is a frequent one. Um, sometimes we like to do, or usually we like to do progress payments, but there are situations where that just doesn't apply. I had a situation recently where the building, there was a building that was doing a large electrical upgrade. They were replacing all the fuse boxes in the building with circuit breaker boxes. And the way that the payment was going to be structured was that the contractor, there was a couple things he was going to have to do in each apartment, and he would get X dollars, a certain amount of dollars for each box that he replaced, and then for some of the other stuff, and then they did the outlets and whatever, and, and everything was based on each item that he did. He wasn't being, he wasn't charging hourly, he wasn't getting a flat fee for the whole project, because the apartments varied, and 
So based on the scope, that was how it was. So that was something that we found out in talking to the engineer. They gave us the schedule of what they anticipated it would be. They didn't know what the exact dollars would be, but they gave us a general idea, and then you know we had that prepared. So when the contractor came, they, they filled in their bid, you know, the bid packet, bid specifications, and the contract then was able to reflect that. Um, there, there are, we have, you know, we have a standard contract that, that we've drafted, that we've crafted, um, but we've, you know, we have, we, we vary it depending on the size of the project, the nature of the project, the nature of the, of the type of work that's being performed, whether it's a, um, if it's a landscaping contract or a management contract, it's, you know, it's, there's certain things and it's a different form that we use than a construction contract. Um, the, the, as far as the actual contracts go, um, oh, back to tracking a second. The other reason why we like to work with the engineer and the architect in those situations is they send out the contract with the bid package, and then the contractor knows exactly what he's bidding on. Not just the specifications, but also the contract terms, the payment terms, the, the time frame that is expected to complete, what the guarantee is that the board expects to get uh, on the project and, and various other things uh, so there's no confusion when they when their bid is accepted there's no confusion that they were uh, expected to have the project completed in you know three months four months whatever it is or that it was going to be progress payments or that it was going to be you know whatever the term is that there's it, it limits the confusion and there's frequently still some negotiating that goes on um, but at least that you know that helps make that process go more efficiently um, we, we try not to get involved too much in a very specific description of the work. We leave that to the bid specifications, um, you know, the specs and the plans that the architect or engineer would draw up. Um, and we usually attach that, or if it's a smaller thing, we usually attach the proposal to the contract because that usually has um, those type of things. If it, was, uh, you know, if it was the circuit breaker type thing that I was talking about, you know, the architect would specify exactly which type of circuit breaker he wanted to go in each apartment, what type of outlets, um, you know, whatever it is, the, the architect or engineer usually will specify that, um, and we, we will refer back to those specifications. If it's a smaller um, situation where there is no architect or engineer, then we go back to uh, the contractor's proposal, we look at that and we use that, and we'll often just refer to that proposal um, in terms of the actual work that he's doing. And the board will always look over the contract. We have we send it to them and the managing agent first, so they can look it over. Let us know if there's anything that that they see in there that was not what they expected or was not what they you know what they thought they were getting. So they look it over in advance. If there's any questions, we deal with it. Um, that way, everybody's on the same page. Um, we we like the contract. Well, one of the uh, other things that the contract has that we like the contractor to be aware of is we want to make sure he's familiar with all the local requirements, that he knows you know, not only uh, permitting and other municipal requirements, but, but the, um, the board's requirements, how you know, clean up of the site, um, you know, that he's got to be fully familiar with the plans. Um, it also, the contract also usually sets forth um, any, uh, the, the method for resolving any discrepancies. Sometimes the contractor sees something when he's already doing the work, that he doesn't think can be done as the architect had, had specified. The architect or engineer creates a set of plans, but there, you know, things happen, and then in the process of the work, he might feel that he can't do it the way they've specified. So we have a procedure in the contract that lets him know who he's supposed to call, what's supposed to govern, so we all know that in whatever situation, how things are supposed to progress. Um, I already alluded to the payment terms. Um, usually we have we, we like to have progress payments, but again, that doesn't always, it's not always the case. Um, we, we like the architect, we also usually specify in a number of places in the contract, we like the architect and engineer to stay involved in the, in the project. Their job does not usually end the minute that the bid is awarded. Their, their job is ongoing. They need to approve the work. Um, if a payment's being issued, especially in bigger projects, uh, where you have an architect or engineer, they should be involved in, in, in ensuring that what the contractor is saying he did, that not only did he actually do it, but that he did it in accordance with what the architect or engineer's specifications were. That he did it with the quality that they expected and as their plans set forth. Um, 
the, uh, it, the contract, as I mentioned, it sets forth the, the warranty and guarantee term, you know, how many years or what the provisions of that are. Um, the, you know, the board needs to know these things. If you're getting a roof, you know, it could be a 10 or 20 year warranty. Um, other things could be shorter, but at least the board has to be aware of it because those are things they're paying for. They need to be aware of what they're getting at the outset. Uh, if there's any confusion, you can clear it up then. Um, we also have hold harmless uh, indemnification provisions and insurance requirements, and I, I won't touch on that too much. I'll let Jason uh, go into that, so I don't step on his toes. But um, you know, those are very important things. You need to make sure that the contractor uh, understands that he's responsible for his men and for not only his men, but any subcontractors that are on the site. Anybody that's on the property during the course of the project, he's responsible for them, and he's responsible for anything not only that happens to them, but anybody else that happens to be coming through, um, you know, while the work is happening. I mean, this is just where people live. So people are, you know, walking by outside, they might be walking through inside. He has to make sure that the site is secure enough and safe enough that nobody's going to get hurt, whether it's his own people or whether it's other, you know, just passers-by or, or residents of the building that happen to be there. Um, he has to be familiar with the local permitting process because it's usually the contractor. Sometimes the architect or engineer helps with this, but it's usually the contractor that gets the permits. Even if it's at the owner's expense, they're the ones that actually go out and do it. I mean, the boards aren't going to the uh, you know, local city hall or whatever to get the building permits. Um, the, the contract almost always specifies the uh, rules about subcontractors. Some deals Boards don't care if there's a subcontractor and they expect it. Some deals, they're hiring a particular contractor and they want that contractor to do the work and they don't want any subcontractors. So we like to, we like to try to make sure the contractor understands that if he's going to get a subcontractor, he has to get the board's approval first. Um, and he's responsible for all those subcontractors and he's responsible for paying them and he's responsible for making sure that when the work is done that they release whatever lien they have, that they get paid, that they don't, you know, to make sure that if anything happens, that they're not going to come back to the, to the co-op or condo and say, I wasn't paid. Um, the other thing that we always have in our contract that we insist on as best we can is a termination provision. That doesn't mean that you don't have to pay for work that's been done, but there are times that the contract doesn't always go according to plan. It could be because you don't like the quality of the work the contractor is doing. It could be because you don't like the time frame he's taking too long. Uh, there, there could be a variety of reasons why during the course of a project you become unhappy with a contractor and you feel it necessary to terminate the project. And we like as best we can to make sure that the board has the right to terminate the contract even if it, and without having to give a reason. Um, you know, that's one of those things that sometimes you have to negotiate and, uh, and give on a little bit, but as best we can that's something that, that you know, we try to insist on. Um, the, the other thing is, as I said, contract is in writing. And similarly, we expect, and it's in the contract, that any changes have to be in writing. So if you're doing a project, and I you know, mentioned before, things happen sometimes, you need to make a change for whatever the reason is, um, that still has to be in writing. Whether it's, a, you know, whether it's an amendment to the contract or a change order, something like that has to be in writing. If it's a project where you're doing change orders, that's another situation where the architect or engineer would have to be involved because they have to make sure that the change that the contractor is requesting will work you know in accordance with their plans that it'll still be okay um, that it all still goes together uh, so there you know that's who the board's relying on for help with that so they they need to be involved in that so you really need you know contractor requests a change order you know the board and the the board has to review it make sure they're okay with it make sure they're okay with how much the change order is going to cost the architect engineer has to review it uh, for that reason a lot of my boards will have me double check it and make sure that everything looks okay from a legal standpoint. Um, so we do that as well. Um, again, the, the contract from a legal standpoint is, is really a lot about expectations, about knowing from the board side what you're getting into, how much you're going to pay, having the security of knowing the you know what project it is that's being done, the time frame it's going to you know that it's going to be done in. Um, in terms of time frame, we, we will, a lot of times the way I get the time frame, if it's not from the engineer or the architect, is I ask the contractor themselves how long they think the project should take. And if they tell me two months, I'll usually put in the contract two and a half or three months. And, and I, 
I give them a cushion so that way, you know, whatever time frame they tell me is, is the longest that they expect it's going to take, I usually give them a little longer in the contract unless there's some particular reason why the board says it has to be done by a certain date. I usually will give them a cushion so that way at the end if they're delaying even further and they get to that outside date and the project isn't done, then we can go to them and we say, you know, look, I gave you longer than you wanted, you know, and uh, they, they can't complain if the board doesn't want to pay them or if they, you know, want to have some kind of penalty for it. That, you know, so they're, they're aware of that. But it's, again, it's all about the expectations and about everybody knowing exactly what's expected of them, what their role is, um, so that at the end of the day, the project gets done in a timely fashion and, and it gets completed as the board wanted within the uh, expense that the board was anticipating paying for. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much. When the Board of Directors of the Co-op and Condo Council was putting uh, together this program, they noted and they stressed that we definitely needed an accountant from both the co-op and condo perspective. Well, we have the accountant in Westchester County. <laughs> when it comes to co-op and condos, Mindy Eisenberg. Mindy has spoken to several of our meetings in the past. She's well known in her field. Please welcome Mindy. Now I only hope I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> So um, from a legal perspective, the uh, contract is really about scope, rights, obligation, and protection. And from an accounting perspective, it really is about money, 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 which I know is something that, um, as boards of directors, we're all very, very concerned about. When I started to think about contracts, of course, construction contracts were you know, one, one of the forefronts of the things I was thinking about. But boards enter into many, many contracts that I think need to have the same type of, of consideration as construction contracts. And I'll talk a little bit about construction contracts, but um, I just want to mention some of the other contracts that I believe that council really should be involved in. Um, one is management contracts. Let's say you're going to change managing agents. Um, a lot of managing agents have boilerplate contracts but um, for the um, unsophisticated board, what you need to realize is that there are a lot of variables in those contracts as well. Um, are you paying a fixed fee? Are you paying fixed fees plus monthly operating expenses? Um, is there a charge for attendance at board meetings? Is there a charge for attendance at union meetings? Um, so a lot of the um, attorneys have actually developed contracts that go beyond the boilerplate that some of the management companies have. Um, and I believe that those contracts should be reviewed by council as well before entering into those. Um, the other thing would be your laundry agreement. Um, there are a lot of variables in laundry contracts when you change laundry companies. For example, how many machines are going to be in, uh, installed? Um, how much is it going to cost per cycle? Um, what is the um, vendor going to do in terms of rehabilitating the laundry room? So again, these um, are contracts I think that should be entered into with consideration and thought and um, also reviewed by council. Um, what about a cell tower contract? In case, uh, I know a lot of buildings here in Westchester, especially ones that are up on a higher hill, um, they've put cell towers on the top of their properties. Um, what is the term of the contract? What are the renewal obligations? Um, who's responsible for repairs to the roof in case there's damage? So again, I think it's another important contract that council should be looking at. Mortgage refinancing documents. Um, another contract. It's a contract to you know borrow a sum of money, uh, perhaps have a credit line attached to it. And you know, attorneys should obviously be intricately involved in the negotiation of um, mortgage refinancing. Um, NYSERDA contracts. Many of you may have been done, been doing an oil to gas conversion. You may have been getting energy credits through NYSERDA or some of the federal programs. Again, I think these are things that um, council should be looking at and reviewing, so that you understand the terms what the benchmarking procedures are, um, what thresholds you need to be able to meet in order to be able to get the credits that have been promised to you. Uh, construction management. Very often what happens is when you take on a construction project, 
You're also bringing a construction manager on site. So for example, if you're doing a window project and you have 400 units in your building and someone needs to be doing all the scheduling of the replacements and the appointments and um, you know managing the project, again, so really just to bring to mind that there are many, many contracts that boards enter into beyond just construction contracts. Um, I think Dan brought up a lot of very important points about the construction contract. From an accounting perspective, I'm both a CPA and I'm also a CFE. I'm a certified forensic ex fraud examiner. And we rely very, very heavily on the contracts. Um, one of the procedures that we do in all of our audit engagements is we reconcile the payments made by the corporation or the condominium association to the contracts. And very often we find that there have been overpayments, there have been change orders where certain pieces of this change orders are actually duplicated in second change orders. Um, so, you know, you could be spending um, quite a bit of money between, you know, these um, energy conversions. Um, down in New York City, we have all the local Laura 11 projects where they're doing major facade projects, I know up here as well. Um, I think it's very important that the financial terms are very well understood at the beginning. Um, one of the important things is retainage clauses, whereby you get a hold back on the project. Um, usually it's about 10%, so that you make sure that you know you, the contractor has some skin in the game and that all the monies are not paid out until that punch list is finished. And again, these are all things that having a, an attorney review the contract from the very beginning, you'll make sure that um, those provisions are taken care of. The, um, in terms of construction contracts too, um, most of the time contractors use what are called AIA documents, which is the American Institute of Architects. And there are numerous forms of AIA contracts. Most of them that you probably will enter into are what are called stipulated sum contracts, whereby it's a flat fee plus allowances for certain things like uh, bricking or the uh, number of you know, feet, running feet of a certain project. Um, and then obviously it breaks down the scope of that project. One of the um, litigations that we were involved in was with a building that actually signed an AIA document that was a cost plus fee contract. And basically their, co their obligation was the costs that were subcontracted out plus a percentage of those subcontracts to the general contractor. And what we found through the course of the project was that the fees that were being presented by the general contractor as being paid to the subcontractor were in fact um, fictitious, they were fraudulent, and the building was overpaying significantly based upon the fees that were actually being paid to the subcontractors. So again, you know, I think it's very important that an attorney be part of that project so you understand exactly what type of contract you're entering into um, and um, what the dollars are going to be in terms of um, those, um, you know, those contracts. Um, should I speak about aging buildings now? Sure. Or? Okay. You can speak now. Okay. So um, the other half of the program that I know is going to be um, what board should be aware of in um, aging facilities. And while a lot of condos were at one point new construction. Um, almost all of the cooperative housing corporations in New York are conversions from rental buildings. And some of them can be quite, um, you know, old. Um, probably very few of them would be, you know, newer than like maybe early 70s, and probably most are even older than that. And what they carry with them is not just the things you can see, but the things you can't see as well. So while you can see a facade and you can see the, um, the things that are visible, what you're not able to see is the pipework, um, the foundation, um, the steel beams inside the terraces. Um, we've seen quite a number of these projects done over the number of years that I've been doing this, which is, I don't even want to tell you how long, but um, you know, the things that come up that you can't see with the naked eye. 
So one of the things from an accounting perspective that we advise boards to do is, number one, whenever you're contemplating a mortgage refinancing, you should be thinking about what your capital projects are going to look like during the terms of that mortgage so that you can have sufficient equity at the time of the refinance in order to be able to meet any capital projects that you're planning on during the term of that mortgage. Um, for those of you who are not aware, commercial mortgages, commercial mortgages are not like the, um, the end loans on your units because you can't just refinance them at will. They carry very large prepayment penalties. So if you have a $2 million mortgage and you're in year four of that mortgage, and all of a sudden you find out that you need to do risers in the building and or you need to do a massive electrical project, you can't just easily refinance that mortgage to take out the equity you might need in order to be able to do that project. So when you go to refinance, you want to think long term about what you may need to do in the project in the building until the time you refinance again. The other thing would be that most banks will allow for a credit line at the same time that um, you are refinancing. So while you may just be paying a fee to maintain that line, it would be important to have a line attached to the mortgage so that it's your rainy day fund in case these um, projects do come up, you were not aware of them at the time of the refinancing, but you have the borrowing capability to be able to do these large infrastructure projects. Um, the other things that are important is you should always keep in, you know, there are different philosophies. Do we borrow or do we assess? Do we have the people who live here now pay for projects that are going to benefit future generations? Or do we borrow the money so that those who are going to benefit from these projects for years to come are paying the cost of these projects? And a lot of it is very philosophical in terms of the boards, um, but it's certainly something that needs to be thought about and considered. And, you know, work with your professionals, work with your attorneys, work with your accountants. We're very often brought in to work on um, assessment programs to help pay for some of the projects. Um, a combination of, of assessments and financing, um, how do buildings, you know, structure their budgets to be able to pay for the financing or to build up reserve funds so that they can start saving the money they need to do those capital projects. So I think the takeaway from what boards need to do in aging facilities is really be aware of the various options available to them and the need to plan ahead for projects that may not be on the horizon at this moment, but to make sure that you give consideration to those projects when you start looking at um, your capital needs, your refinancings, and things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Great job. Thanks very much. When the board, again, was planning this program, we decided that we needed the perspective of construction professionals. I'm happy to report that tonight we have some very, very top-notch construction professionals. Our first speaker in that scenario will be Dr. Richard Cerulli. Richard is a construction consultant. He is a professor of business and economics. He is the former chair of the Facilities and Construction Management Program at Iona College in New Rochelle. And he also is a frequent contributor to Impact Newspaper, our monthly publication. Please welcome Dr. Richard Cerulli. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. Uh, what I want to address tonight is the economics of Asian buildings. And we all know economics is a dismal science and by the time I get through with this lecture, I'm going to convince you it is truly a dismal science if it doesn't put you to sleep in the next five minutes. Uh, when we start talking of economics of an aging building, uh, there's two terms that should come to mind uh, as an owner. Uh, one is the opportunity cost, and the other is the production uh, possibility curve. Uh, the opportunity cost, uh, in layman's term, is the next best alternate. And a textbook example would be is when you graduate high school, 
do you go to college, take on the debt, and give up four years of income, or do you go to college, pick up the debt, and earn your money over a period of time so you're earning, increase your earnings? So if you were to go to, if the choice was to go to college, the opportunity loss was four years of income. And this is a decision that a lot of businesses uh, sometimes fail to see, and in all my years in the industry, a lot of owners never look at opportunity cost. So if we take a look at of an aging building, <clears throat> there's a couple of ways you could approach it. One is the building is aging and it needs some type of maintenance and preventive maintenance. So your first option would be to bring in a professional, an architect, and someone who does diagnostic testing, maybe on a semi-annual basis, and say, let's see what the state of our building is. And you may spend a very small amount of maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars depending on the extent of it. <clears throat> or you can make the option of not doing it. It's not broke. You know, don't fix it. And you could wait and defer that, and the opportunity cost is going to be ten years later. Uh, you don't have a, a minor um, problem with the building. You have a failure. Uh, where fa uh, facades start to fail, you start getting leaking in the system, the roofs start leaking, and then you have to put in a tremendous amount of money to fix something which could have been avoided over time. So the opportunity cost would be basically, do we take a small amount of money, say $10,000, do some diagnostic testing, <clears throat> bring in a professional architect or engineer, and actually do some type of capital improvement assessment. They're relatively very inexpensive and will tell you well in advance what needs to be done. And, and many times it's deferred to the point of failure. And that brings us up to the next topic, which they call production possibility curve. In layman's terms, it's basically guns or butter. And at that particular point in time when the building starts to fail, and you have to start putting money into facades, roofing, or things like that are very expensive. You're putting money into a facade, and for every dollar you put into that, you're taking money out of revenue, and you're taking money out of architectural up upgrades which make the building architecturally, aesthetically more pleasing. So since the money that we're dealing with is finite, you know, for every dollar you, you spend for butter, it's one less dollar for guns. And that's what really happens when we start managing a lot of these buildings. And <clears throat> I think when we look at this, we have to look at this very carefully. And at the old days of just calling a roofer in one day and just do some quick patching, are over because technology today, roofing systems are very complex, the chemicals are very complex. And there was a number of buildings where I went on and somebody said, well, over the last four years, all we did is we put this, we called it roof and we put this tar on and everything was fine. But a lot of these different tars are very sophisticated materials and they're not compatible. And the actual repair tar actually accelerated the deterioration of the roof. So by putting, you know, spending $5,000, they want the patent to spend $300,000 a few years later. And that's the opportunity cost. And that gets back down into the uh, production possibility curve. Uh, there's a finite amount of money, how are we gonna spend it? And it also gets into accounting, which are long-term values, especially present values of money and things like that. So <clears throat> uh, when we start looking at aged buildings, it's very important to do that. Uh, for those who do work in the city, uh, there is local law 1011, which you have to have your facades inspected every five years on a five-year cycle by an architect or engineer. The reason why that law came about was because in 1980, at Columbia University, a medical student was walking on a sun taking a walk on a Sunday morning, and a piece of masonry hit her on the head and killed her. Needless to say, there's an attorney here. Uh, you got your hands full on. So that is pure negligence. Uh, the city was so outraged by this that the building owners were not really being good stewards of their property. They put a local law 1011 program, that means every five years, you have to have an architect or engineer come in and say if the building's safe or unsafe. And if you fail to do it and a brick fits somebody, it's not a criminal, it's actually at this point it's a criminal offense. And the opportunity cost is very high. You know, maybe 10,000 for an architect inspection or 10 years in prison, you know? I mean, that's, that's some, you know, on a very extreme case. So <clears throat> when we look at this, we, I think we have to look at it in a very practical way in terms of saving money. Uh, so when we, we look at <clears throat> dealing with the older buildings, it's basically cost avoidance 
and trying to do good preventive maintenance so in the future you don't have to get stuck paying some tremendous expenses that you know you can't afford and since construction costs are very expensive you know we like to push it to the right next year next year next year but uh, when the economy not so much now but when the economy starts booming uh, construction prices accelerate much higher than the CPI because at that point those, ex those prices could accelerate depending just on supply and demand could go as high as 20 percent so if you can't if you can't afford it this year uh, are you going to afford it three years from now at a, at a you know at a 15 percent escalation rate What's so CPI? <laughs> you said CPI. Consumer What's that? oh consumer price index I'm sorry I told you I'm an economist we're very boring people you know? <laughs> so with that um, we, uh, we had an architect who was supposed to be here tonight, but uh, something came up. But, you know, architects, you can't depend on them anyway, so it's just far from the course. I mean, any architects here? <laughs> well, some are good. Some are, some are good. Some are good. But, but anyway, what the, it, you should have a, a design professional architect or engineer who's well-versed in, uh, you know, building envelopes and aging buildings. They know what to look for. They will know how to correct it. Uh, and you actually have, have to, and if the building is unsafe, you'd much rather catch it at the very beginning phases before it becomes a major problem. And especially if you're a co-op or a condo and you have to start replacing walls over multiple units, your chance of lawsuit by the tenants are even greater. So your opportunity cost is actually much higher. So with that, I want to turn it over to the next person who has a great experience in terms of actually doing diagnostics. So I didn't quite put you to sleep yet, so I think I'll exit before I do, being as an economist, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Great job. As you can imagine, someone as well-versed as Richard in his area comes across outstanding professionals on a daily and monthly basis. We have one this evening. His name is Adriano DiFilippo. He is a senior consultant with a firm named Metrospec Building Diagnostics, which is based in the Bronx. Adriano told us this evening that he will most definitely be joining the BRI, so even though he's the rookie, we are very happy to have him here and offer his opinion on this topic. Adriano, it's all yours. Thank you, everyone. I'm not going to bore you with economics because I don't know the first thing about economics. So, Rich, thank you for uh, putting up. Thank you. Putting half the room to sleep to make sure everyone's still awake. So, we still have coffee still out? The coffee's still out there? Okay, good. good. All right. So, um, whoops. So, essentially, I provide building diagnostic services to many of the facilities, um, you know, uh, commercial, commercial facilities, residential facilities all over throughout Manhattan, Bronx, Westchester. And one of the most neglected items that I've seen throughout every building that I've been to, well, let's say 98% of the buildings that I've been to, is the two dirty words that everyone hates to use. Does anybody know what it is? Preventative maintenance. <laughs> Nobody likes to do preventative maintenance. Um, one of the in addition to that, the most neglected part of preventive maintenance is the building facade. Um, a lot of people don't understand that a, a facility is a living, breathing thing. And the facade, you have to think of it as the skin. So the first thing that's going to go is the skin. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the programs that we have out, you know, when the building first opened up, when it was new construction, um, never has never been updated. So just by a quick show of hands, from the last time you've seen a preventive maintenance done, who's a, who has updated it since then? I didn't think so. It happens, it happens more often than you think. It happens more often than you think. Uh, one of the most high impact items of a facility, um, aside from the facade, is uh, the HVAC system, fire life safety, which should actually go before the HVAC system, uh, the electrical distribution, which then follows by the building envelope. Um, by a quick show of hands, how many people have an active preventive maintenance program set up with their facilities right now? Meaning it's proactive, you have your uh, building engineers or maintenance guys actively going and checking uh, 
know, building equipment, running tests. I see a lot of head shaking. I'm starting to get nervous. Do we have a lawyer in here? We do, okay. Um, two of the most common, going back to uh, the building facade, uh, two of the most important aspects of the building facade is something called a vapor barrier and a thermal barrier. Does anybody know what a thermal or a vapor barrier is? Okay. Um, a vapor barrier essentially is uh, the resistance of moisture coming into the structure. Uh, it doesn't take much to break that, that barrier. Once you do that, that's when you start getting mold, you start getting pests, uh, you start rotting out your foundation, uh, and you start causing all types of, of damage on the interior of the building. Uh, the thermal barrier is, uh, is more financially, uh, financially geared because you're, you're, you're allowing unwanted, um, excuse me, uh, unwanted uh, climate from the outside entering the building, therefore causing you to you know, run your ACs longer run your cooling towers longer for those who have cooling towers. And we all know how much cooling towers cost to run. So, um, you know, those are two of the most neglected parts of the, of the, uh, the facade. Um, a brief study that I've done on a couple of the facilities is that on average, an average 15-story building will cost, with um, a compromised Thermal and or vapor barrier will cost you approximately $12,000 a year in waste. So you're looking at about a thousand, you're looking at about a thousand dollars a month just out the window. How many people have extra money to throw out in their budget? I don't. Um, one of the most uh, current technologies that, that are out right now that could actually aid you in, in preventing these type of deficiencies is, uh, is infrared. Has anyone ever had an infrared inspection done? You have, okay. You have as well? That's excellent. Uh, there's not, that is probably the most underutilized piece of technology that's out right now. Um, for those who don't know what infrared is, it's essentially um, measuring heat signatures off of different materials used in your building. So in other words, if you have a leak, somewhere hidden in your facade, you perform an infrared inspection, you will be able to see the water, where it's originating from, where it's winding up, and what it's affecting. Um, that, that is probably the most effective and most cost-effective solution to figuring out what deficiencies you have rather quickly. There, it's, it's inexpensive, and it will identify where your issues are almost immediately. Um, the average cost of an infrared inspection is, is peanuts compared to what the repairs are if you don't catch what you're looking for. Um, an average infrared inspection, depending on the size of your building, uh, is anywhere between 1,200 to 1,500. So, yes? Has, has that infrared improved since the early 90s? Oh, absolutely. But to the point where it really is what it says, Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Back in the 90s, it didn't work. Back in the 90s, you know, I've, I've gotten this before. Back in the 90s, people were, for, has anyone seen Jurassic Park? <laughs> where they got the guy with the dinosaur, he's coming, and they have the infrared, and you can see it. Like, that was a much earlier version of that. Um, but now you can see, you know, the, the accuracy of what you're measuring is down to 0 0.01 degrees. So you can do either a qualitative inspection or a quantitative inspection depending on what you're looking for. Um, so it, yes, since the 90s, it has become a lot more accurate and a lot more widely used. As a matter of fact, is anyone here looking to, um, looking to turn their facility into a LEED certified building? LEED actually um, is mandating that infrared inspections have to be performed in order to receive, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's the lowest, which is LEED certified. So if you're a LEED certified and you're doing uh, work to your roof or you're, you're qualifying for those credits, you have to do an infrared inspection in order to prove that whoever's doing the work has done it in accordance to uh, the efficiency standards. Um, 
Um, infrared is also versatile for a lot of other things. You know, mainly it's it's the facade, but uh, you know, also catching electrical hotspots, um, mechanical mechanical issues. You know, HVAC equipment, fans, belts, motors, and so on. Um, you know, roof damage. That's a big one. Uh, it's very easy to see roof damage when conducting these type of inspections. Um, so, if anyone who has had uh, any type of roofing defects, it's, it's probably a good idea to get it done. Uh, you know, it's quick and painless, and you'll be able to even go back to your contractor who may have recently done the work and go back and, and you know, just make sure that whatever he has done, you know, was done the right way. And, you know, we all know how much a roof costs, so, you know, to make sure that they do it the right way. Sometimes you take a look at it and you may not know, you know, oh, it may look okay. You know, he may have just painted it and walked away. You don't really know until, you know, here comes the winter and the summer and you have, you have a waterfall in someone's living room. So, or a jacuzzi, depending on how they use it. So, um, um, at the beginning of this year, um, proactively try to seek to incorporate this into your uh, facilities PMs. Um, I have found it throughout various projects that has become invaluable. Um, especially in aging buildings. Aging buildings, they seem to uh, benefit the most from it. You know, a lot of people between changing management companies, different contractors coming in, uh, the, uh, the, the evolving use of, of different types of materials. You don't really know what has happened before you, uh, you know, before you have gotten there, before you've had control of the building. So, um, you know, it is, it is definitely a good piece of technology to, to look into. Um, that's all I have for today. I would appreciate appreciate everybody having me here, and uh, enjoy your night. Thank you. Thank you, Adriano. Jason Schiano, as I mentioned earlier, is co-president of Lemon First Associates, the insurance manager for our associations. Jason will cap off our program this evening by touching on both topics from the insurance perspective. It's all yours, Jason. Is anybody upset that the architect didn't show up? <laughs> I actually asked uh, Jeff if I could go last because I'm talking about both subjects. <laughs> Why did I do that? All right. Uh, I have a handout. It's on your tables. Does anybody know the font that I used for the small text in the charts? 9 Proman 11. Anyone else? It's Times New Roman 10. Oh, yes. Oh. So I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is you probably can't read this because it's too small. And I had a lot of information to give you. The good news is I'm not going to read it all for you, so you'll be out of here quicker than you thought. All right. Um, insurance affects, obviously, uh, legal contracts and aging buildings in a plethora of ways. So I, I put some bullet points down. You can read them. I'm going to try to be really brief. The first one is with respect to legal contracts. Um, obviously, there's an insurance section in every or most legal contracts. You want to make sure that based on the purpose of the contract, the job that the contract is outlining, etc., there are certain types of insurance that should go along. Uh, with the um, requirements and the job that's being outlined in the contract. There, there are a number of different types of policies. You've probably seen them in contracts before that you're going to require of a contractor, whether it be a service contractor or a construction contractor, uh, general liability insurance, auto, umbrella, workers' comp, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've listed the policy types and the reasons why you may want to have them. And examples of claims that can happen as a result of a certain type of contractor's work that that particular policy might respond to. So, you know, always good to check the, the insurance clause to make sure that the insurance is appropriate to the, to the work being done. There's usually and should be a hold harmless section holding the building harmless as well as the property manager and the board. Um, importantly, uh, Reverse hold harmlessness have started to crop up in a lot of uh, contracts and, and even um, agreements, purchase orders. You'll see this with snow plowing companies uh, that's come up in the last couple of years where the insurance company that's insuring the snow plowing contractor is telling the snow plowing contractor, you're not allowed to indemnify the building that you're plowing for and we want you to get their indemnification. 
so that the building, the condo, the co-op, is actually holding harmless and indemnifying the snow plowing contractor. The worst possible thing that you can do is sign something with a reverse indemnification. So be on the lookout for those. Additional insured on a primary non-contributory basis with waiver of subrogation, you can ask your broker what that is, uh, but it's good to have. Uh, you may want to get the insurance policy declaration pages if you're doing a really big, expensive project with a lot of exposure, like people on roofs or hanging off the side of a building, to make sure that the insurance policy doesn't have the exclusions that we're going to talk about at that February meeting, which you should come to if you're curious you know what I'm talking about. And also notice if the insurance policy is going to be canceled or changed or non-renewed. As an uh, additional insured, you can have the right to get that notice. Uh, in advance of, of the cancellation or, or change. So that's kind of the insurance related issues with respect to legal, top, uh, legal contracts. And then on aging buildings, uh, from an insurance perspective, most of you that are on boards or managing agents or, um, or even lenders are familiar that insurance companies come out and inspect buildings and then they issue what they call recommendations, which is kind of a misnomer because if you don't do the recommended things that the insurance company wants you to do, what happens? We've talked about this before. Your insurance can get canceled or it can get non-renewed. And if you don't do those things, and if you've got an older building, sometimes those things can be a lot. There can be, uh, they want the, the roof repaired or replaced. They want sidewalks patched, driveways patched, uh, brick pointing. If you ignore those things uh, and your insurance is non-renewed, you're probably going to end up paying a lot more money for your insurance for the money that you save by not doing the projects and you may get less coverage with uh, not as high quality a company. So think twice before not doing the insurance company's recommendations. It's usually money well spent. And it's also money well spent because those insurance company recommendations, for, in particular for older buildings, are normally things that can actually cost you a lot of exposure, whether it be liability exposure or property damage exposure, such as if you've got fuses, we talked about a contract involving the replacement of fuses with circuit breakers earlier in the night. The reason why insurance companies don't like fuses is because they can cause fires. Fires can burn down your building, which is an insurance event costing millions of dollars. It can drive your premiums up, and it's also a risk to the people that live there. It can hurt people or kill people. So. I've listed a whole bunch of examples of aging building conditions that can result in insurance recommendations, and if they're not addressed, can result in insurance claims. And that pretty much sums it up. If you have questions, happy to speak to you afterwards. Have a good evening. Thank you, Jason. We do have a bit of a period for questions and answers. Does anyone have any questions for any one of our panel members? Cesar Manfredi. And on your contract, uh Standard uh, social behavior clause, like uh, no beer on the property, uh, sanitary, and no, no urinating on the property. I, I can't, honestly, I can't tell you if we have those two particular examples <laughs> in our contract. I can't tell you if we have those two particular examples in our contract. I know we have, um, and we have some in general, yeah. Because I, I'm particularly concerned about no alcohol on the property. Somebody gets hurt, they've been drinking beer for lunch, and it gets to be a major problem. Right, the, the question was, um, do we have in our standard contract any social behavior clause? We, we have something, I, I honestly, I couldn't tell you without looking at it right now, it, it, you know, if it mentions the two particular examples of uh, beer or whatever, but I, I would say that those things are probably covered. I mean, I think our provision is a little more general, but it's kind of a common sense thing. Anyone else? Hang on, Mary, I'm on my way. Then Lewis Katz. Hey, you are, Mary. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sirley, I think this is. <clears throat> what, probably one of the biggest arguments we've had on our board is for big projects, when to use an engineer and when not. Some people say it costs too much money. Let's just throw a bid out on a you know, penny saver and let's see who comes in. And of course the problem is that if you just leave it up to the contractor, you're going to get three different bids for three different totally types of work. So what is the percentage, I mean, for big jobs like, uh, you know, uh, replacing the front steps and replacing a roof, that you should use an engineer? And is that always a, a given that you should always use an engineer? Oh, sorry, I'm a little hard of hearing. So. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm sorry, so uh, the question was a uh, general. The bottom line is really how often do you need to use an engineer, if at all, on big construction projects? To use an engineer? Well, um, you would have to find an engineer or an architect that's very versed, well, well versed in cost estimating. But that's very important. There, you know, every architect or any profession has their subspecialties. So you need someone that's that's very well versed with construction costs. And also, when you do bid a project, uh, one of the bigger problems that um, and it's a problem I confront all the time is if a client calls me and we put something out to bid and the bids come back, and you get a cluster of bids around a certain point. Then you have the outlier at a high, then you have the low bidder. Uh, what I generally would recommend to a client is take those cluster bids, get the mean, medium, and mode, really don't even entertain the outliers, because if you have, say for argument's sake, you know, 10 bidders on a job, and seven are in that cluster, that's the real cost of the project. And I've heard clients, you know, tell me, I'll take the chance for the lower bid. You know, it's the three hundred thousand dollars less, two hundred thousand dollars. I'll gamble for two hundred thousand dollars, and they never win the, the bet because by the time the job is over, they usually don't pick up the scope of work, and you probably pay more than the highest bidder with change orders. But what, but what is the criteria for when you should use an engineer and when you don't need to use one? Well, I, I think it depends on your comfort, uh, your own comfort, in terms of the scope of the project. I mean, if you're doing a very complex project, a very big infrastructure project, I'll even go back farther. If it's um, a sizable project, I would always recommend the architect have the scope of work. That, I mean, that's, I, think the, I think I'm answering the question a little bit better now. Uh, <clears throat> if you're going to have a project that's sizable, you don't really want the, the contractor designing the project. You, you, you can't, because it's a conflict of interest. Uh, because a contractor will, rightfully so, a contractor is out to make as much money as they can, and even if they give the best service, they, they're out, that's what it's all about. And so their interest is for their own interest, obviously, as a business, where an architect or engineer is really paid to be the owner's representative. So if you're doing a project, and I think it's, I don't think there's quite a dollar amount, but I, I would probably say that it's the, the best way to proceed is to have an architect or engineer because you have a scope of work. Uh, I mean, the typical problem I run into, and I ran into this very recently, was, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, okay. finish, finish your thought. Okay, and uh, was that um, they put out a contract for windows, replacement windows, and, you know, one bid came in at 200,000, and one came in at, 60,000 and it was a commercial project and they and the person at the $60,000 window was a residential builder someone who just did houses not commercial buildings they didn't know if it was an aluminum clad building what the R value was the U value was so when you compare the two you wouldn't even compare apples to apples if they put the $60,000 contract then the windows would have failed because they would have lost in energy and everything else so I, it's, it's, it's always err on the side of hiring a, an architect or engineer. Okay? Go ahead, Dan. I, I, just, I just wanted to add one thing that I think one thing to keep in mind is that whenever you're bidding out a project, whenever you're doing a project where you have to send out bids, whether it's construction or any kind of contract type situation where you're sending out bids, it's, as you just alluded to, you need to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So when you get four bids, three bids, whatever it is, you need to know that you're comparing the same thing. If it's a simpler thing that you can come up with the specs and you can say that, you know, here's what the specs are and you want them to bid on that, fine. If it's something that's more complicated and, you know, and so you need an architect or an engineer to help you come up with that set of specs so that the contractors can all bid on it and then you might need their services to help you then evaluate the bids to make sure about that, then you need an architect or engineer. I mean, in, in some ways, if you're asking the question, then, then you might have your answer. You know, if, it's, if you yourselves as a board can't come up with the specifications and, and it's not really either your job or necessarily your training to be able to do that, although some boards obviously have people that are versed and can assist in that, but 
you know, other than that, if it's not, you know, that, that's not necessarily your job. So that's why you have professionals like engineers and architects that you hire to help you create those specs. You know, obviously there's some situations where it's simpler. You know, if you're not dealing with construction, you might be dealing with a laundry contract or managing agent contract. You know, then you don't, obviously you don't need necessarily another professional, but you know, and a basic thing, you know, some kind of basic contract, you know, if it's painting, you might be able to come up with your, you know, with your specifications. But something more complicated, if you as a board don't feel comfortable in creating the specifications so that you know what you're going to be getting, then that's when, you know, that's when you would need it. I think um, I would just go one step further um, in terms of not just creating the specifications, but putting together what's called an RFP, which is a request for proposal where the same request is going out to all the potential bidders so that they're all bidding on exactly the same project and that the bids are basically tailored so that you can compare apples to apples. But in addition to just the bidding process, what we find in terms of um, using architects and engineers is that they're also your eyes and ears on the ground so that when a requisition is made for payment, from a contractor, um, most um, architectural requisitions, the AIA, AIA requisitions, require the sign-off of either an architect or an engineer before payment would be made, and basically they're certifying that the work was done in accordance with the specifications and that the, the dollars that are being requisitioned, that the work was actually performed. So. Um, I think it's not just in the specification process, but it's also in the ongoing um, supervisory process to make sure that the work is being performed in accordance with the specifications and um, with the, um, the, you know, the parameters that were laid out. Lewis Katz, you had a question. Um, yes, um, the difference between an AIA, you were talking about that you've written up contracts which do you prefer, your type of a contract that's handwritten versus an AIA contract? Or, uh, I mean, you know, which way do you go as a co-op? Well, I mean, I don't sit there and handwrite it. I have it on a template on my well, computer. But, um, I mean, but no, I, I personally, I, I don't like the AIA contract. There's a lot of things in it I don't like. There's some things in it that I do like. Our contract, our different templates that, that we have, um, actually, we do incorporate a number of the provisions from the AIA. We've, we've taken a number of those provisions, but we've also um, changed them and added them, and, you know, added things, and and uh, you know, we've we've crafted it in our own way. So I, it's it's you know, I can't say that necessarily blanket. I don't like the AIA. Part of the reason why we drafted our own contract is because logistically it's a lot easier. There, otherwise there would be so many changes to the AIA, it's not in word form, it's not an easy template to use. We would be making so many changes every time. This way, we've done it all in advance, we have it in the form that we want with all the changes that, that you know we wanted, and it's an easier, I think it's, I personally think it's an easier layout. The AIA one has a lot of short sentences, and, and I, I don't think it's necessarily the easiest thing to look at myself, but, um, I mean, so I prefer my, I prefer mine for that, you know, for those reasons, which is not to say that there isn't anything in the AA that's good. There's a lot of good things, and I've used a lot of them. <laughs> we have time for two more, since we are near nine. Okay, hang on, Sandra. I'll be right there. I don't have to work out tonight. I'm walking around the room. tonight from several of the panelists up there, the recommendation and the wisdom of having inspections done to assess the condition of your building for future, you know, when you're getting financing or what have you. In other meetings, I've also heard from legal that once you do that, you're liable to get those repairs done. So how does the board make a decision of whether to get these inspections and then become legally responsible for getting that work done, and maybe you're not in a position at that time to do it, or going with it. Um, from an accounting standpoint, um, there's a difference between having um, an understanding of what projects are going to come up over the next number of years, in other words, knowing that your roof has a 20-year warranty and you're in year 15, 
or that you're looking to do an, um, you know, an oil to gas conversion, or that you're in the fourth year and you have a local or 11 project coming up, versus actually have an engineer doing a what we call a replacement study. Um, once you do a replacement study, and I'll let Dan speak to the legality of that, but for those of you who have audited financial statements for your properties, which I'm sure most of you do, um, there is a recommendation by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the AICPA, that um, they recommend that co-ops and condos include in their financial statements a um, CIRA study, where you're supposed to take all of the component parts of a building, you're supposed to basically scope out their estimated useful life, um, their cost of replacement, and how the entity is going to fund for those eventual replacements. Um, both the legal community and the accounting community is very dead set against putting those engineering studies in financial statements because um, I think that, and so do the attorneys in, in, in New York metropolitan area, that it leaves the corporation or the condominium association wide open in that if you didn't anticipate something and someone bought on that understanding that you would open yourself up to a lawsuit. Um, we also don't believe from an accounting standpoint that an engineering study has any place in um, an accounting document. So um, m almost all buildings, I would say probably 99.9%, you'll see language on the front page of the audited financial statement stating that they did not do the CIRA study and that um, co-ops have the ability to uh, borrow or assess or defer capital projects as required and um, similar in um, condominiums. So the diff there is a big difference between having a formalized engineering cost replacement study and being aware of what your major infrastructure projects are and when in fact they may need to be done and an approximate value of those um, replacements. Thank you. And just about the only thing that I would add is that as you said, when you do the replacement study or the capital study, you have to start budgeting for it. You have to, you have to add it into your budget and you have to plan for it, and then if it's necessary, you have to you know you have to do that um, that work. But um, you know that that's the problem, and it's it's a difference between being aware that these things are out there and knowing that your roof has a certain warranty, and then you know as was just mentioned, ha doing a formal engineering study where then you have to put it in your financials, you have to have it factored into your budget, and if it's factored into your budget, you have to then start basically putting aside the money. I mean, if you're saying in your budget that that you're budgeting twenty thousand dollars a year for for future replacements. You have to actually be budgeting that and putting that somewhere. Oh. Robin Steiner of our Managing Agents Council wanted to make a quick couple of points. Hopefully, I won't need the microphone. I really appreciate what Mindy said, what David said, um, Dan said. Um, as someone who's managing properties and dealing with both of their firms and other firms, other legal firms, other accounting firms, and accounting. What we found is tremendously effective uh, because we do have an, older, an aging building stock today is to do some kind of long-term capital study. Keep it in a draft form. You know, you, but let, let your residents know because what's going to happen is that lo and behold, you're going to have to replace a roof in the next two or three years. If you don't start planning for it now from a financial standpoint, and also from a public relations standpoint, you're going to surprise the heck out of, you, out of, out of your, your shareholders or your unit owners. So it's really important to do something. And I agree 100% that you don't want it in the financials because one of the things that neither of them mentioned, because they're polite, is that there are different levels of engineering studies. There's good ones and there's bad ones. And the bad ones are going to say that you need $200,000 to improve your building. And the good one's going to save $10 million because they're going to be very careful. And if you have similar buildings, you're going to have a lot of trouble explaining that to potential purchasers over time. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Robin. This concludes our program. Many, many thanks to Daniel, Jason, Mindy, Richard, Adriano, and all of you for attending.
going through the emails for the next notice on the membership meeting of our call up on condo council. And again, the BRI's general membership meeting is this Thursday at 6.30. Once again, thanks. Have a great evening.